Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Thank you for the kind Wir invitation. In Berlin, We are in Berlin, which is a formerly divided city, where streets and remnants of the wall still remind us of Europe and how it suffered from the war and confrontation. And it also reminds us that we owe peace, prosperity, and confidence to the political cooperation within the European Union, the United Nations, and the many other multilateral organizations that Germany is represented in. Germany knows in order to find solutions for global issues, and we have quite a few of them, we require global fora that enable us to speak with one another and not about one another. When in the 1970s the G7 process was created, this was a response to a global economic crisis. The pioneer and initiator of this format, and let me mention this, this was somebody from Hamburg. He was was the former Federal Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. Up to then, there had been no forum in which the global economic powers spoke to each other. There was no format in which they could have an exchange on regulating the markets. As a response to the Asian crisis, in 1997, Bill Clinton took the initiative to create the G22, which in December 1999 then was created in today's format as G20. So this timeline shows that there was always a specific occasion, a global challenge that kicked off a global debate. And this was always about solving very specific issues and working on solutions jointly. So the questions that have been on your agenda over the past days can also only be solved if the leading emerging countries and the developed countries come together at many levels. Those who have political responsibility, NGOs, but also scientists like you are. Through this cooperation, remarkable success has been achieved. Let me just remind you of the common response to the financial crisis. First, we had a successful macroeconomic stabilization through quick and determined action in the field of monetary and fiscal policies in order to mitigate the most severe effects. And also very specifically where those were hit hardest, those that were least responsible for the crisis, that is the citizens themselves. Back then I was the Minister of Labor and I reformed the benefits for workers who were on short time. And this was my contribution to avoiding mass redundancies. It was not only good for the employees, but also for our economy that came out of the crisis faster because the available workforce was still in the company when it was needed. Apart from the immediate stabilization, the course was set so that a future financial market crisis could not repeat itself so easily. The G20 launched comprehensive reforms for a better regulation and supervision of financial markets. It also created the Financial Stability Board, and in the meantime, it has become a highly regarded institution in the field of financial market regulation. Since its creation, the G20 format has turned into a global steering committee. And this institution has some importance. The member states represent 85% of the global gross national product and three quarters of the global exports. In our states, two thirds of the world population are settling down, and this also gives some legitimacy. This is why the G20 can initiate regulatory frameworks and can also kick off standards and work towards fairer conditions for all, for instance, with the Vision Zero Fund. It is good if international trade is supporting economic growth in emerging countries, but the groups also have to assume responsibility, for instance, when it comes to improving occupational health and safety in poor reproduction countries and improving social security systems. And this is why the agreement at the G20 summit in Hamburg on global supply chains was so important. This goes to show when strong international organizations assume their responsibilities, there is significant improvement for all, even in difficult times. This is more pertinent than ever today. Many urgent questions were discussed by you, trade and investment, food, social cohesion, and democracy.
The questions and issues require a clear commitment to multilateralism, which I am happy to give to you today. But multilateral approaches, and much more than in the past, need to reap very specific results that we have to implement as those who are responsible in the political arena. And here I see two challenges. The first is digitalization. This is a challenge for all countries in this world. With the digital transformation of the industry, of production, of communication, globalization has taken an entirely new course. I am convinced that we are only seeing the early phase of this development today. And in this early phase already, digitalization has two sides. It can enhance prosperity, but it also has the potential to lead to upheavals and to promote promote inequality, be it globally, be it nationally. And this is why we cannot leave it up alone to the free interplay of market forces. We need to shape it wisely. And this means we need to see to it that the considerable potentials of new technologies can be used positively for more prosperity and the negative effects shall be limited as well as possible. So the new technologies are challenging the social welfare concepts that that we developed roughly a hundred years ago. And as back in the day, those countries will be most successful that are successful in adapting in an equitable way their society to the new challenges. If apps and internet platforms go hand in hand with the new forms of outsourcing, labor and social legislation needs to respond to this. If people are suffering from bogus self-employment and are no longer employed by companies, we need to readjust benefits and rights that were so far tied to businesses. And in such industries and industrial sectors, we need well-organized trade unions and strong employee representations in order to organize participation, good working hours, fair pay, and social security. In the digital world, software and hardware are produced across the globe, and they are shared within seconds across borders and continents. The value chains and work in general are completely newly aligned. But how do we guarantee labor and social standards in other countries of this world? Only if we can bring in line clear standards and rules. This could be employee protection, wages, but also tax liability and taxation of international groups and internet platforms. This is why it is highly pleasant that all G20 member states have collected policies and the T20 task forces are working on further proposals for solutions. Digitalization is confronting us with another question. How do we tackle companies that create data monopolies or oligopolies? We need to set legal frameworks, but it is hardly possible at the national level. And this is why countries need to cooperate because of the practice of such groups. There is an increasing pressure on labor markets and the bargaining power of employees employees is reduced. A current study of the economists of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is providing us with the data. In the global digital company, very few large companies are holding ever larger market shares. So this market power of very few superstar companies leads to increasing monopolistic profits. And on the other hand, the share of employees in value creation and the wage share is reduced. Producing. And for competition, the formation of monopolies is also not a good development, let alone data freedom and data security for our citizens and the risk of abuse that goes hand in hand with complex data collection. And this is why digitalization is an important focus of the German government. We invest in the digital infrastructure for cities, for villages and schools. We want to make it easier for our citizens through the modern digital state. But we also have tax law, we have the world of work and democracy at large, which we are focusing on because digitalization is requiring new security and rules. Digitalization is also changing uh, 
less recent development as a new development, and it will also accelerate it. It is globalization, and this is already exemplified in the fields of trade, goods production, logistics, and services, and it affects fundamentally the lives of all our citizens. A central issue is therefore re-asked again, how do we shape our world? With many, globalization has a bad reputation, even though over the past decades, by and large, it was a success story. The prosperity gains are considerable for all participating countries, and what is especially pleasing is that extreme poverty was reduced worldwide. For the global agenda and reaching the sustainable development goals, this is a very important step that we should not underestimate, especially not as Europeans. Some of you might be familiar with the study of the economists Branko Milanovic and Christoph Lankner. The numbers demonstrate impressively that at a time of strong globalization, the middle classes in the emerging countries could clearly increase their income, especially the most populous countries in Asia like China, India, and Indonesia contributed to the formation of a global middle class. A major winner is Germany as well. Our economy is internationally interconnected at all levels and many jobs depend on this. Especially the small and medium-sized enterprises supply goods and services for the world market. The other developed countries at large benefited from globalization as well. But even so, ironically, it's especially the citizens from the affluent developed countries that have become especially skeptical. Many are insecure and believe those that are advocating national policies and confrontative policies as solutions to all problems. And those who claim that it is better to pursue one's own interests alone without considering the interests of others. This is a major and a dangerous error. It is an error that we have to prove wrong through practical policies. We need to understand what's going on in the world. And with us at home, we need to find strategic solutions and offer them. When we try to find the root causes for this skepticism, first of all, we look at the data on the distribution of prosperity gains. There is a general global trend, and the IMF and the OECD have pointed to this. The traditional blue-collar jobs and the middle classes have come under pressure. And this is turning around the same question, which is at the center of the experiences and biographies, the topic that has also been put to the fore by Argentina's G20 presidency, the future of work. In many industries, production has been relocated and others suffer from wage dumping. In many developed countries, poorly paid service jobs have been created and some even speak of a new service proletariat. Many professions can be automated, many services can now be offered as mass products, many communicative services are being performed by algorithms. Self-employed people People and small companies are also wondering what their prospects are, like the logistics service provider who has to work day and night, because at the moment there are so many requests, but he doesn't really know whether his services will play a role in the future when they're will be 3D printers everywhere. Be it in Germany, in Europe, or in the United States, everywhere our citizens want to know from us what the future will hold. You see this in the United States and in the UK, where many traditional industrial regions were just left behind. And whoever grew up in such regions will not believe so easily that globalization is something everybody can benefit from. So even in nations that traditionally identify with free trade and that have great international interlinkages, even those nations see a change in the general attitude. And this is then an attitude which is turning against all multilateral institutions, also against those that stand for successful cooperation, like the European Union or the G20 process. It is our task to reconvince our citizens, especially those who have parents and grandparents who benefited from prosperity through globalization. Through our policies, we need to show that in view of the upheavals and stresses, 
caused by globalization, there are better solutions than protectionism. In international relations, this can only happen through a rule-based, fair international order. But the states also have to use their influence for their societies and provide a smart social welfare framework that leaves nobody behind. In Germany, the dynamic economy managed to create new jobs and therefore compensate for the loss of jobs. And this is an achievement which is based on many factors. For instance, the comparably good education and vocational training system, the generally accessible and free of charge universities, as well as the system of consensus building between employees and employers. In many European countries, Countries, through welfare benefits, we could compensate for wage losses even at the time of a crisis. This is the European model of the combination of democracy, economic freedom, social security, and this strengthened by the cooperation within the European Union. It is not enough to say cooperation is good, trade wars are expensive and unnecessary. There is always another task that we have. We have to take away the concerns from those that experience how in the globalized economy professions, activities and life worlds change quickly, those that they have become so accustomed to. Those who hold political responsibility need to become active as a state, but also as a member in strong international organizations, we need to respond to two problems. How can we do this? It is a government obligation to create a framework that offers opportunities for all that leaves no one behind, which is the basic principle of the Agenda for Sustainable Development, and it is very fitting here as well. The basic opportunity for everyone is education. From political experience we know, and current studies do confirm this again, there is a clear correlation between good and accessible educational systems for everyone, that is for girls as well, and the empowerment of employees. The more governments invest in childcare facilities, in schools, in vocational training and universities, the fewer unskilled workers there are. And digital training is part and parcel of this, and here Western countries can learn from the partners in Asia. Those nations will benefit from the new opportunities provided by new technologies that can enable large groups of the population to access this knowledge and know-how. But let me warn you against a false conclusion. It is, of course, good and right that we made our educational system permeable and that higher education and university education is open to everyone. But we need to enable our citizens to live a good life without prescribing how this can work. Condescension is not a virtue. Craftspeople, skilled workers, and service provisions are our central activities for growth and quality of life. We are a society that is highly based on the division of labor. Everybody is making their contribution, and this needs to be reasonably remunerated, but recognition and respect for work are also values we cannot forego in an open society. So you can have a very happy life as somebody who works as a truck driver or a nurse or in the service industry. So for all of this, our countries need solid income. An appropriate social infrastructure can only be funded if we have a prospering economy and if that everybody who earns good money is also contributing to funding our system. And if states are not competing with each other by ever lower tax rates and reducing their own income by this, this is going to be good for the overall result, which it is not right now. This is why it is so important to fight against tax fraud and tax evasion. G20 developed many good approaches, for instance, the new international standard of automatic exchange of financial account information in tax matters between tax authorities. It becomes clearly more difficult to hide income from tax authorities. And then we have the OECD recommendations commissioned by the G20 for measures against base erosion and profit shifting. With these recommendations, it is becoming increasingly difficult to shift taxes in a way, or shift profits in a way, so that they hardly have to pay taxes. More than 100 countries have now joined these initiatives, and 
Therefore, the G20 managed to set a global standard. And this is a standard that is a matter of justice. We need more of that and not less. We need to show our citizens who reliably pay their taxes that globalization is not giving people carte blanche to withdraw from the obligations of society. In more and more countries, there is an insight which is gaining ground. Without international cooperation, social justice at the national level is ever more difficult to enforce. One of the most successful multilateral organizations in the world is the European Union. It is indispensable as a model of peace, of freedom, and of the economy. In a world of almost 10 billion people, the European Union increases the influence of member states. What matters to us is something we also lay down in our trade agreements. In the free trade agreement between the European Union and Canada, we firmly anchored employees' rights, consumer protection and environmental standards, as well as the right of the states to set their own rules in the interest of the public. The agreements with Japan and Singapore are to be signed this year. The negotiations with Australia and New Zealand are going to be started this year. And with Mexico and Mercosur, we are on the final stretch. It's always good to talk. This is the guiding principle of international cooperation. We need to understand the developments and find solutions. But let me add, it is good to talk, but it's better to do something. And this is why, firstly, we will work for international legal standards that ensure social development, fair pay, good working conditions, and environmental standards. Secondly, we will see to it that the state is fulfilling its public duties, making available public goods. For this, we need solid income and the solidarity of other states. And this is why we are fighting tax fraud, tax dumping, tax evasion, just as we are fighting anonymous company creations in tax havens. We want to shape globalization in the way we envisage it, according to the principles of law, social and ecological security, and the distribution of profits and benefits that can generate growth and prosperity for all. In order to tackle the central issues of digitalization, we will also use taxation of digital services, data protection, and ensuring consumers' rights, as well as shaping remuneration of workers work and working conditions and the digital connection of schools and educational institutions and a smart realignment of our infrastructure. Global problems require globally thinking institutions. US scientists can tell us what is doable or what is advisable, but we as politicians need to choose the best solutions for our communities and implement them so that talk does not stay cheap talk but turns into action. Thank you very much.